Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from the world of Elderbrain, creators of the upcoming adventure Crown of the Oathbreaker. The one and only, the man known as Tom. How are you doing today, man? Hi there. Uh, all good. Great, great to be with you. Mm -hmm. So, a bit of a tradition before we get into um, Crown itself is the humble beginnings. Now, with that, with that in mind, I'd, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that stuck with you. Oh uh, well, uh, actually, the uh, Crown of the Oathbreaker. Uh, it's it's three old time, old school friends of mm -hmm. mine, um, and we've been playing together for the past twenty five plus years. Mm -hmm. um, mostly D and D, so it's 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 our core group. Uh, you know, who's who's finally funded the or founded the company. And uh, set out to, you know, create uh, a grand campaign. Um, and actually, I was playing with Dave already in uh, this is like late '80s um, with Legos, and we created our own uh, kind of uh, D6-based, um, you know, rule set mm -hmm. to to play with Lego armies and and. You know, set up our castles in the covering the entire room and topography, and there were hills and uh, all kinds of rules for different weapons. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's where our, our our first kind of exposure to to role playing games came from. Already before we knew that you know even role playing games existed, <laughs> and uh, we got into second edition. That was with with uh, Gabor already, the three of us, mm -hmm. and um, you know we've been playing since then solidly all kinds of game systems. You know, not only D and D, but uh, uh, we moved heavily into Pathfinder as well, and now five fifth edition, and when we're we're testing out um, Pathfinder two mm -hmm. um, currently. Um, so actually, we just played. Um, still playing Age of Ashes. <laughs> it's take, taking a long time, um, but we have a couple simultaneous campaigns going on. But uh, we're heavily influenced by uh, Call of Cthulhu and uh, Cyberpunk as well. Um, and uh, I'm a historian mm -hmm. by by uh, by profession, so I'm into um, you know more more kind of historical settings and. Uh, and but sci-fi, you know, horror, and and definitely uh, dark fantasy is 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 uh, is what we like. All right, I g and now that pr now obviously my introduction to you to you guys what is through the upcoming um, adventure Crown of the Oathbreaker, but I had also seen that you had that you had developed a pre a previous adventure called Year of Rogue Dragons. That's right. Yeah. Um, now, given the given the fact that you get that was was Year of Rogue Dragons ki kind of a kind of a test run to see if you guys could um, write a f write a full adventure in your style. I I exactly. So it was kind of a, a pilot uh, project, and uh, mostly Gabor was involved in in writing that. Um, I was more in the kind of consult consulting or, or and and editing side mm -hmm. um and but but it was a we had a an idea you know back in the actually way back in the day uh how cool it would be to to play with uh you know dragon characters so actually you know pcs that were that were dragons mm -hmm. and and you know what how, how the the stats and you know how an adventure should be laid out to you know creatures that are ancient uh you know super powerful um, can fly, you know, and 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 what kind of dungeons and and uh, you know encounters would work well with with uh, with these creatures. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've always liked to play evil parties, so that that's been um, kind of 
kind of steady in in our long long years of of rpgs um so so the adventure was suited for for um you know obviously chromatic uh dragons and uh it 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 was great to write it it was a, a nice you know intellectual endeavor and eventually um we, we got to publishing it um it's in the forgotten realms so mm -hmm. it's a kind of official fr uh content um and it's actually based on the, the novel by the same name um you know year of road dragon so it, it's it takes place in a historical during the draco rage um, you know, on FR, F, in, in FR, which is a, you know, grand uh, kind of historic occasion mm -hmm. um, or or event in, in the history of the realms. Yeah. And uh, Crown of the Oathbreaker is, is, in a sense, a, a direct continuation of, of our, you know, creative endeavors um, in that we were thinking of what the next adventure should be. And uh, to be honest, we were completely stuck on, you know, what direction to take it. So should we stick to writing adventures for evil monster races? And then we had some cool ideas, you know, devils even, or, mm -hmm. or ghost, ghost characters, or, you know, some, something outside of the box, or maybe like an orc or goblinoid um, setting on a war path. Um, and we, we really couldn't decide amongst the three of us. So we created a grand 150 plus question survey on, you know, what people like or, or what are the favored aspects uh, with regards to, you know, plot, NPCs, settings, uh, magic or, you know, traps in dungeons, um, how people like to play. So what, mm -hmm. what their playing habits are. And uh, luckily, we had about 2,000 responses. So it's it's a, it's a very interesting statistics came out, you know, on what the, the whole community would like to see. And uh, we went about crafting an adventure, Crown of the Oathbreaker, completely based on kind of the wish of the community. Mm -hmm. And and since it's, it was a community... Uh, approach uh, to begin with, um, you know, Kickstarter seemed to be the, the the optimal platform to get it in front of as many people as possible. And we already had a pretty nice solid uh, group of, of uh, individuals, you know, backers who, who were already involved in the project and, and couldn't wait, you know, for for the campaign to, to begin. And, uh, you know, Thankfully, we had a, an amazing campaign, and uh, Crown of the Oathbreaker is going to be a, a reality. Mm -hmm. We're in knee, knee deep or neck deep in in writing it uh, at the moment, and uh, we have an amazing group of of artists and illustrators who are pretty much dedicating their entire year to you know creating the amazing illustrations that we have you know, coming in from them every day almost. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful time. Now, with Crown, with Crown of the Oathbreaker, you, you set it up as a, as a uh, adventure going from levels 5 through 12. Um, yep. Now, I'm, cu I'm curious, that's a very interesting level range, and I'm curious what was the reasoning for that particular... Um, um, beginning and end point for characters. Well, we we broke up the uh, you know optimal character ranges from one to twenty um, mm -hmm. in the survey itself, and the vast majority of people. So there was a statistical um, you know arrow that pointed to uh, this five to twelve range as the as the most popular, basically. Mm -hmm. so purely purely the survey. And, and almost, you know, everything about the adventure from, from the fact that it's based around a cursed artifact, um, you know, that the archvillain should be a, a warlock that's infused with some kind of avatar or, or an aspect of a, of a deity um, to, you know, what kind of minions um, 
or, or monsters there should be, which is heavily aberrations, for example, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, the setting being a kind of medieval, you know, kingdom where there's a monarchy. Um, so it, it centered, the story centered around, obviously, a, a king and, and the royal family and, uh, you know, dark secrets from the past uh, that, that come to light during the course of the adventure. Also, planar, you know, elements were, were very popular and uh, the most favored uh, realm was the, the, the Feywild. Um, so we've, of course, included a, a, a sandbox um, type setting in, in the Fey realms. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the entire story is, of course, centered around around the curse that comes from from these wild, uh, you know, extra planar settings. Yeah. Now, given that it's referred to as a is referred to as a multi-layered sandbox in its description, um, now sandbox can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I'm curious how you guys um, one um, approach the idea of this being a sandbox campaign, and two where the multi-layered um, part of that comes into play. Sure. So um, since sandbox settings were or seem to be more popular than than kind of linear or, you know, more in kind of directional narrative based uh, um, adventures, we've uh, added actually three different sandbox kind of areas into the adventure. One is the capital city, city of uh, Onodbir. Um, where the adventure starts and, and kind of the, the center of events, um, as well as the greater kingdom of Aglarion and the Fey Realm domain of, of Bleak, the Bleak Mire, mm -hmm. where the players will need to uh, venture to, to actually lift the curse um, from, from the crown. And uh, the multi-layered aspect comes from the fact that uh, the Fey Realm, and actually there's a foray into the Shadow Plane or Shadow Fell as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the Fey Realm itself, of course, it's, it's a parallel plane. So it exists, you know, parallel to the kingdom itself. And many of the locations have an effect on each other, for example. And the capital city... Um, players will, of course, uh, experience its kind of normal setting. Then another one when the curse hits, and then another one when they they'll get to travel to the shadow plane. So the the capital city exists, of course, in the shadow plane as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's a fourth aspect of the capital at the very end of the adventure, when the city is overwhelmed, kind of a post-apocalyptic, uh, zombie-infested uh, status. And, of course, it's totally different, and there's a mass combat uh, encounter at the very end of the, of the adventure. So by kind of multi-layered, we've, we're using the same locations uh, in, in a lot of times, but presenting them in you know, new, new ways. And, of course, it's more fun when players were involved already with, uh, with uh, certain locations, but they're completely different or turned upside down. Mm-hmm. And each sandbox, just so you understand, has about the city currently has about 120 locations. The great, the greater kingdom about 80, mm -hmm. and the Fey Realm, Fey Realm uh, setting as well. So it's it's hundreds and hundreds of different locations, most of them with their own hooks and kind of side stories or side quests, and uh, even you know named NPCs that that of course have their own motivations and, and affects the, the nearby areas, you know, so all of the sandboxes are set up. So players will need to explore pretty much the whole map. Um, not necessarily because you, that the sandbox means that to us, at least that the order of the, uh, you know, how players visit the different locations is up to them. And, uh, and, and there's no kind of linear path to take, but you can go, you know, roam the map and and uh, explore the the whole environment. All right, I get, I can definitely get behind that. Now, given the given the fact that one that it's you that you guys are aiming for a dark adventure with the with the whole thing of the uh, of the cursed item. Um, 
some something that I'm cu something that I'm curious about with with that is the kingdom that it's set in. Um, and get and Galerion. I'm ho I'm yeah, hoping I got that yeah. right. Yeah, you got it. it's uh, Eglarion, so Eglarion. with an A, Eglarion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Within with within the book it's within the book itself. Do you have a section set aside for kind of a primer of the set of the setting and how it was before things went south? Sure. We do. We have uh, actually, and this is, is pretty much finished already. Um, it's about sixty pages so far. So mm -hmm. we have a campaign campaign setting that goes into a lot of details on on the world or the kingdom that that we have created, um, touching on all kinds of uh, you know important uh, details, uh, history. You know, neighboring lands, neighboring kingdoms, um, as well as customs and common sayings to factions, different organizations and factions in the kingdom, and as well as locations. Mm -hmm. uh, most most of them are are of course post curse um, because that's when players will experience most of them. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a you know a basic uh, description as well, and and we we do want to publish the pre curse uh, status of of the kingdom in the in the campaign setting, and then of course the post curse one in the adventure itself. Which that makes that makes sense, um, and give, given given this particular setting, I'm cu I'm curious if you also have. Um, have have written in some sort of seeds or the like to in, to help integrate people's characters within the setting. Ab absolutely. So there's a lot of organizations, as mm -hmm. I said, that that people can belong to. Um, we've handled kind of religions as well and and kept it pretty open. Mm -hmm. um, our concept there was to to have more kind of. Uh, um, you know, aspects of, of important uh, powers and and concepts um, and many times opposing so for example light and darkness mm -hmm. or uh, or death and life you know these kind of polar opposites and within each of these so you know uh, for example or, or knowledge um, um, and and many of these and competence for example mm -hmm. so to to present them in a way that that each can be a vast you know shift or spectrum of alignment so uh, you know death death can have of course good followers who, who want to respect life and and nourish it and and uh, you know stave off death to to people who want to inflict death and and you know that's their thing so so um it, it can easily be integrated into any setting you know that's that's the kind of approach uh, our approach to it um, but we also try to to introduce a lot of original ideas that can be used, of course, in in your own homebrew or or any other you know location where you like to play. Mm -hmm. And I'm ge and I'm guessing I'm guessing that was all, I'm guessing that's also the reason why you had listed out that characters could play um, exotic mon exotic monsters and still f and still function. You're not trying to go for the standard heroic races as a assumption. Yeah, that that's right. So um, we had this idea that uh, you know, due to to actually a blessing, time of of blessing before the curse, it's a kind of reverse effect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was uh, incredible uh, bounty and and uh, you know, uh, high standard of living. So of course, very little strife in the kingdom. And uh, this, you know, led to tolerance as well. And, uh, you know, each kind of even monster races would have their roles to play in a society where, you know, uh, goblins or, or even hobgoblins or bugbears, you know, would be tolerated. And a kind of leaving alignment, you know, set in stone out of the picture, which we don't enjoy too much uh, to begin with, mm -hmm. um, you know, restraints like that. Um, and uh, and it leads to more variety in in the setting and and uh, 
you know, people, as they said in the survey, love to play exotic, you know, monster races, tabaxis and, um, you know, lizard folk and, and whatnot. So um, in the play, in the campaign setting, we, of course, a lot of NPCs and, and uh, kind of hooks are, are based on these. Yep. And speaking of that survey, I did want to ask about how that, about how that was particularly structured. Now, not the survey itself, but more of how you stru how you structured the responses to the responses to it was it a was it a case of just measuring what the what the what the higher results were on each or was there or was it a case of um formatting the bullet points for lack of a better term that people that people wanted you to focus on yeah, sure. Um, I, I, it's a it's a good question. Um, actually, uh, I I recommend that that you are, and and you know viewers can can go to our website mm -hmm. elderbrain.com, and on the Crown of the Oathbreaker sub page, there's actually a survey evaluation PDF. So every single question, um, you know what it was, what the results were, and how we kind of interpreted that, and incorporate a couple sentences each, on on how we fit that into the the adventure itself um, so we took basically every uh, question and answer and and you know of course obviously the most popular one or plural so most popular ones where the decisions were kind of split or where we wanted to showcase both of them or even three answers and uh, you know we kind we kind of weave the the spine of the adventure around that um, and uh, and there was a lot of elements that we needed to touch, mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of incorporated those into the to the main uh, spine or or kind of framework um, of the plot itself. So we started with the plot, um, and then moved on to you know different actors in 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 the adventure itself, and then the locations and magic items and you know various spells and and or kind of finer details uh, later on. All right, I got you. Now, within now within this within this particular um, this particular summary, um, and I do I do see that on the Indiegogo you had put you had put up the survey ev evaluation. Um, mm -hmm. One of the th one of the things that I'm cu that I'm curious about. Is you get you guys are de are designing this both for Five E and for Pathfinder Second Edition, which That's right. was re was really a surprise since the third party end of um, Pathfinder Second Edition hasn't hasn't gotten a whole lot of momentum just yet. It's it's been a, it's been a slow it's been a slow go, but yeah. when it com when it comes to it, is it a case where you ha where you guys have the concept written out first and then and then how and then go into the crunch on how it's going to work for 5e and pathfinder separately or how did you come about that and was that the was that the initial plan that you had from day one with this project uh it it was from day one because uh we found that that there's actually an almost kind of 50 50 split in interest so a lot of people uh i think play uh, you know, 3.5, so the the older edition of Pathfinder, um, and are just now moving on to to second. Um, it's a huge undertaking. So, um, you know, luckily we have decades of of uh, you know RPG experience between us. So, of course, we can we can handle the the stats. It's going to be at the very end, so the conversion. Uh, we're keeping everything really open right now, mm -hmm. and then of course it's you know when we get to the, the and really almost the last step will be, you know stat blocks and monster stats and classes and and you know the the kind of nitty gritty DCs and and what the actual check required is called you know whether it's uh, uh, perception or occult or you know what what whether there's advantages or disadvantages, or like in Pathfinder, you get you know uh, levels of 
of conditions. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's a major undertaking, um, especially with the immense complicity of Pathfinder, uh, the direction they took it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but I mean it's it, it's it's it shouldn't be that big of a deal because it's really only the the statistics part of it and not the you know the story and the motivations and and the settings themselves. So mm -hmm. first, you know, first we write the narrative, and then we will incorporate all the statistics and and uh, you know basically the stat blocks. So that that will be the very very end. And uh, to be to be truthful, you know, we haven't had too much experience with with Pathfinder Second Edition, but you know, all three of us are are diving deep into the into the giant rulebook. And uh, and we're dedicating most of our um, you know sessions, RPG private sessions, to to Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. So we should be good by the end of the year to uh, you know to do an easy conversion on that. And and sorry, we also have a couple consultants, you know, who are playing. That's all they do now. Um, friends of ours, so definitely they're going to proofread it and and uh, you know give us their their uh, expertise on mm -hmm. on. On Pathfinder, so um, we're not we're not too mm -hmm. scared. Now, given the fact that your given the fact that your uh, previous entry was strictly spe strictly speaking um, fifth edition, and then and then you're venturing a little bit into th into this with mm -hmm. a bit of Pathfinder second. I'm curious if there were any habits you had with fifth edition that you that you had to either unlearn or relearn. When uh, when applying them to Pathfinder Second Edition, since they are since they are very different beasts at their heart. Yeah, they're they're completely different. Um, um, of course, it's D and D, so it's not 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 totally different. You know, not hundred percent, but uh, you know, but ma many of the rule sets are are are. You know, there's there's huge gaps. Uh, between them, mm -hmm. um, it's. I don't think it's. A, it's a matter of you know unlearning or or uh, having a different mindset to it. it. It's just going to be crunching, I think. And since many of the you know encounters or, or monsters are from our own imagination, um, you you know we can pretty much gauge. I think what kind of challenge rating we put to a monster. I don't think, or I'm not. A fan of of uh, you know create you using kind of monster creation rules for example um, because I know the level of the encounter I can kind of you know I have a lot of or we in in the group have a lot of experience in kind of setting you know monster uh, statistics towards a, a sample basic character mm -hmm. um, you know, level. So it's. Uh, I don't think it's it's that big of an issue. No, I um, I could. It's it's one of those things where I could see I could see some people, um, taking taking to it more taking to it more than others. It's re it's really a it's really a case by case thing. Um, yeah, sure, sure, of course. Now, what now um. I will admit that when I look when I looked at the different parts of the um, cr of Crown of the Oathbreaker and with within the adventure summary and what and what each part entails, um, mm -hmm. a vibe that I ended up getting was um, was a kind of sandbox to a point, i.e., um, tiers and tent poles approach, where each each part has the main fo the main focus of the story but also also side objectives that can be done would that be a fair assessment of the flow of the adventure oh a absolutely of course so there's there's different sandboxes different uh, you know areas mm -hmm. and then there are kind of funnels uh from from one to each so um there are parts of the story where it takes a more kind of concentrated directional approach and and which again opens up to to a, a whole new sandbox so um it's it's more about as i said the order 
where the party you know achieves each objective mm -hmm. and there being multiple objectives or components uh, to undertake within each sandbox all right without without giving any spoilers mm -hmm. <laughs> now when it comes now given the fact that you guys are go are going for both 5e and Pathfinder and the fact that this is taking place in its own setting I'm curious if um if you have some if you have some space set aside for delving into um char character b character um backgrounds or mechanically representing the f factions and of course when I'm referring to backgrounds in this I'm referring to the mechanic end of it from character creation in 5e and it's equi and it's equivalent um sure is there an, uh, is there anything yeah. like that yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we also will have a, a player's guide uh, mm -hmm. kind of booklet or section, and uh, it since the you know the campaign, the crowdfunding was was ex extremely successful, and we pretty much unlocked all our stretch goals um, eventually. Uh, we've included thirty six different uh, archetypes or subclasses, uh, basically three for each uh, base class. Um, that, you know, most of them will have uh, either a, a, a presence in the adventure or can be tied in very easily, mm -hmm. um, as well as several dozen uh, backgrounds, um, which, of course, have direct uh, ties and, and hooks to the story or the locations or the different fractions involved. So, um, and not to mention, of course, the range of items that we've created and uh, and spells and feats as well yeah. which again are, are all kind of uh, connected to different scenes so different chapters in, in the adventure itself and given the with the with the players guide section is that a section of the book or are you planning a are you planning a um, separate um, book itself uh, it's going to probably, due to page constraints, it's going to be a separate booklet. Of course, the PDF will include the adventure, the player's guide, and you know the campaign setting as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we kind of undershot it, I think, um, with our, our estimation of, of size. So I think it's going to be three different uh, uh, you know print products. Of course, to all, all our backers, you know, who backed the, the project will get all three of them who, who chose the, the print option. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but the, you know, the, the campaign setting is already about 60 pages. The player's guide, I think, will, will be smaller than that. And the adventure is, is planned or was planned around 350 pages. So we're looking at a 500-page book um, in total, which might be a little difficult to we saw that the limits are around four, four fifty, but uh, you know, six hundred is the limit. Um, but maybe even easier to to keep them separate, because, for example, the campaign setting will feature an NPC mm -hmm. kind of booklet or appendix, um, and we have about a hundred uh, kind backers at this point. Uh, since you know pre-order is still available on on Indiegogo, mm -hmm. um, and one of our our pledge levels or reward levels is to become an NPC in the adventure, um, where we take the photo of the backer or a photo that they present to us. So it, it can be of yourself or of a loved one or even you know a famous person or totally fictional or imaginative mm -hmm. or imaginary. And our artists, you know, create a, a fantasy drawing of you and we place it and weave it into the adventure itself. Um, you can name your character and even create a kind of, uh, you know, one sentence summary kind of, of, of what their uh, personality is like or, or appearance and, and profession mm -hmm. or occupation. And... Uh, and we have about 109 NPCs right now who are going to be, you know, backers, actual people that will be featured in the story mm -hmm. with an illustration. So it's a it's a heavily heavily illustrated uh, tone. 
and it's one of the most popular rewards. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I can I can I can understand why. Um, and give, given that, how um, since you mentioned page constraints, how many how many page how many pages are you shoot are you shooting for with the project? Well, as I said, the plan for the adventure itself is about 300, 350. Mm -hmm. And then the campaign setting and the player's guide should be another 100, 120, 150 max. Oh, all right. Yeah, so it's a, it's a big big book. Mm -hmm. And I'm, gu I'm guessing the PDF version will be properly um, bookmarked. Yeah, properly bookmarked, of mm -hmm. course. Um, um, We'll, we'll release all the maps with, uh, you know, PC versions and, and DM uh, or GM versions as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with, with numbers and, of course, uh, you know, secret doors and, and things marked in and on the player version uh, not. Um, so that, again, is a kind of separate product, which, of course, will be in the, the, the PDF. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's, it's, as I said about, we have, you know, three maps of the capital city mm -hmm. uh, one in the shadow realm one normally and one kind of post-apocalyptic one and then two terrain maps hex grids with Eglarion and and the bleak mire and mm -hmm. and 25 other maps you know encounter maps which are beautifully illustrated and and you can check out actually on all our social pages where we Post them regularly. The moment we get it from our <laughs> designer, it goes up into uh, you know our Discord or or Facebook, Twitter, um, you know social channels. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend you you check those out. Mm -hmm. And actually, high high definition ones are already available, so you can use them to play. Yeah. Now, with now um within the within the module itself, it it does it does talk about and you you mentioned this. That there, that you have a bu you have a bunch of new subclasses slash archetypes, um, three three for each cl three for each class, and I'm not going to ask you to go through all of them, obviously, because I'm sure that'd be a bit spoilery. But could you give me a selection of of some of them and the ge and the general vibe for some for for their um particular playstyle? Uh, sure. So uh, m many of them are are um, of course appear in the adventures so either through opponents or or um, or NPCs. Mm -hmm. um, just to name to give you a few. So for example, since the adventure has uh, you know this is the curse is 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 a curse by hags. Um, so there's for example warlocks that have a, a hag uh, patron. Mm -hmm. um, for warlocks, um, they have uh, frenzied mutant uh, minions or barbarians, um, you know, who can use their their rage ability to to assume mutations. Um, there's a an abjuration specialist uh, wizard, so it's a sentinel wizard um, who has a shop in the the capital city. Um, there's a royal menagerie, mm -hmm. so the the king has a king has a monster zoo, and uh, caretakers there are beast tamers. So these are rangers that that can, um, you know, tame even large uh, beasts and and uh, have all kinds of abilities, you know, related to that. Um, let me think like a. a Versatile fighter who's who's a mercenary, mm -hmm. um, you know who can who can uh, kind of build fame and and uh, and haggle prices. So of course choosing to to serve the the demands of the market or the highest bidder, um, and and use all kinds of combat tricks. So you know these kind of things. A, a full list uh, is available on on you know on our stretch goal description mm -hmm. since we've. When we've unlocked all of them, and I think we also put out an an update on on our crowdfunding sites. On so you, you know you can you can check out each one of them. And as I said, many of them are uh, either choosable as uh, by the players, you know, since since they will encounter them throughout the course of the adventure, or by um, you know through NPCs and and uh, and, and, uh, and foes as well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, now, with with the ones you mentioned, with the ones you mentioned, aside from the versatile fighter, um, a lot of them are definitely on the magic end of things. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious. What I'm curious, what would be an example of a archetype that you'd give for a monk? And I will admit, I'm partially asking that because it's my gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, for for monks, uh, off the top of my head, I I remember two of them. The third one, I I have to conjure uh, mm -hmm. somehow. So there's a a, a kind of a tentacle monk. So that that way of the tentacle mm -hmm. that uh, can 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 do kind of grab and and uh, you know manipulation attacks. Um, there's also a kind of fiendish monk. So the monk of the the nine. Uh, nine seals i think we called it mm -hmm. which is a kind of infernal uh, tradition you know so very strict and and uh, you know pedantic and and uh, based on you know infusing attacks with with infernal energies and assuming kind of traits of of devils um and then the third one was i think a a, a, a stone fist so kind of object uh, destruction and and uh, you know more kind of resistances. So making your your fists and hands and body into stone. Mm -hmm. I think those were the three three monk uh, archetypes or subclasses. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to um, ma when it comes to magic items, um. And and part of the reason I'm asking about magic items is obviously while well, the MacGuffin for this whole for this whole thing is a cur is a cursed item, but sure. what would be what would be a few what would be a few um, examples of some of the some of the types of magic items that could be se that could be seen throughout the adventure, and are a lot of these a similar case of you might see these in in, in um, encounters. Uh, yeah, of course. So most of these items are uh, in in the story itself and and can be acquired by players. Um, many of them are, you know, wondrous items because that's those seem to be the most popular, um, and of course weapons as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just to name name, give a few examples. Um, for example, the the shield of the Spriggans. Um, which allows the the wielder to grow to large size, like a spriggan does, and the the shield becomes a humongous shield, of course. Um, you know, as it grows with the with the wielder as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have a zombie mask. Uh, that's a disgusting. Uh, actually, the the skin, you know, the face of a zombie, uh, which hides you from. From undead, so they perceive undead perceive you as their own, as as undead yourself. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's nauseating to 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 wear it and to put it on. Um, there's an animated uh, net, you know, used by gladiators in the arena mm -hmm. or the battle of the champions. Um, there's a key which opens uh, any lock, so it's it's it functions as a as a greater knock spell, and really the it's called the master key because it it literally unlocks even the most magically sealed locks, as well. Um, there's an a chest of magic uh, annihilation, mm -hmm. um, which is an anti magic box, and anything you store within it uh, loses its its magical properties. Um, and the whole range of other items, uh, all of them beautifully illustrated, and uh, and and all of them with with uh, you know a main kind of uh, role in the story and and uh, connected to locations or NPCs. And I'd also I'd also seen that when it comes to when when it comes to one of the um, rewards with the pro with the project was. The um, card was the reference cards, and I'm guessing those reference mm -hmm. cards are apl are applied to monsters, magic items, um, and sp and possibly even spells. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. So and even feats. Mm -hmm. So the deck the deck is 120 cards, 
and it features every single major NPC. There's uh, 44 of them um, in the adventure with their stat blocks, of course. So because mm -hmm. those were those are of course the the, the most significant encounters. Every unique uh, monster in the story. We have about a 20 20 of those, um, and uh, items and feats and spells. So that's that's for easy reference. And of course, if you're if if it's spells or or feats or items, um, you know, GMs can give these out to their players as they acquire them. And the monster and the NPC cards are, of course, easy to show to your players that, you know, this is the the NPC that you're talking to. And their, the back has their a summary of their stat blocks. Uh, you know, not not so, usually not the full one because of of uh, you know, of course, dimension constraints. But a kind of reference card, so to to give their main stats and to make encounters more, uh, you know, quicker and and so they flow more easily. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to feats, obviously Pathfinder is a very feat centric uh, design. Yeah. But in both cases, do you have do you have feats that are not ostensibly tied to tied towards a given class or a given playstyle? In um, e yes, obviously that can happen with five E, but is that also going to be the case with the feats you're adding for um, Pathfinder? No feats, we 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 kept very general um, mm -hmm. and not usually not connected to classes on purpose. You know, uh, as you said, it's 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 a totally different approach. Um, there there are very you know heavy limitation and requirement limitations in Pathfinder five E. Obviously, it's it's. Uh, it's, it's more general, and and we wanted to keep the feeds because most of them are covered by classes already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to keep them as general as as possible, and uh, we didn't go too crazy uh, with feeds. Um, you know, wanted to to you know class options to present more class options in the subclasses. Um, but you know, many of the the encounters or NPCs in the story. Do have various feats that we wanted to use, you know, because they're cool, or or we, because we felt they were missing from from game systems, mm -hmm. um, you know, such as shadow casting, for example, so, so shadow conjure um, feats, uh, things like that. Especially since we have a, a sandbox in the adventure dedicated to to the shadow play. Yeah. Um. Well, since you brought up shadow casting, let me ask, let me ask about that. What what does that what does that entail, and what what exactly did you what what are some examples you can think of of feats that were de that were delving into things you f you felt weren't being touched upon already? Um, well, I, I, as long as I as know, um, and I might not be hundred percent sure, but uh, um, you know the five E kind of version of of. Uh, uh, a sh shadow mage, um, you know, the fact that uh, they manipulated phantasms um, into reality or semi-reality, and actually, uh, it was tangible shadows that they conjured or or evoked. Um, you know, that kind of rule system that it's harder to dispel. So it's a, that it, that it's a different type of of magic source. And and uh, you know manipulating the weave of magic in in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. So that was missing. For example, the spell thief um, was a, a really cool old concept. You know where a thief can actually steal magical effects or auras mm -hmm. or even spells. You know and 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 strip you or strip opponents or even items um, from their magic, um, which which has a lot of kind of versatile use and and cool. Role-playing uh, options, um, you know these, these these kind of thing. Guild Wizard uh, was another one, um, you know where where you're relying on on a, a wider source of magic than your own personal kind of powers. Um, so kind of looking, you know, looking back to to old school uh, concepts that weren't um, continued or or haven't been published yet, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and uh, and putting our own spin on it, of course. So it's, it's not not plagiarized and, and not <laughs> not ripped off, but uh, but put 
putting our own uh, kind of light or, or spin on these subjects. Yeah, I, I can get that. And I, as as it's, as as the wisdom goes, um, if you steal if you steal from one source, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen sources, it's research. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and we do have to have, of course, at the end a very heavy, you know, research lab. Uh, to see that you know to make sure that it, it is different you know than than stuff that's out there and mm -hmm. and and since we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different rules you know we want to make sure at the end that that it, it is unique it is our own take on it and and it's new and and refreshing and and not copied you know yeah and when it com when it comes to when it when it comes to spe when it comes to um, spells, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that a fair amount of the spells that you're adding are based are, are based around the different um, planes that will be present within the adventure. Um, yeah, and, and and situations, I think mm -hmm. more. So, for example, we had a situation when players need to escape a, a closed environment, and then of course a kind of necromantic gas uh, spell that has an effect and kills the you know people in the enclosure but they rise as undead mm -hmm. who have a special kind of you know effect tied into this gas or this mist um which is a spell that they use um and and uh, it was original but some some spells that we found were for example missing from 5e or pathfinder um that we found that you know we couldn't believe that that uh, it, it's not there and uh, and uh, you know so we created them ourselves so it, it's it's a kind of mixed bag I think mm -hmm. um, but but of course it's it's co most of them are connected to the story yeah now when it come now when it comes to the when it comes to the dungeon maps that you've got that you've got now obviously I can't obviously I can't ask you to to go through all of them because you've got 25 map you've got 25 maps each with their own each with um, a GM version and a player version. Um, sure. The f the first thing I'm curious about is are is when it comes to these dungeons are they full multi are some of them single floor and some of them multi floor or is it a case where they lean more towards one or the other? Um, no, it's 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 a it's a mixed mixed bag. Mm -hmm. Um. There's many. I, I would say most of them have different uh, levels. Um, most of them are are to the kind of smaller or medium size. So mm -hmm. so we don't have too many kind of grand maps. Um, the royal palace, where a lot of the events take place, will feature you know different parts of the palace um, that we that we will focus on you know, five, six different kind of areas within the palace, with mm -hmm. all of them with, with, of course, multiple rooms on different levels. So it's, it's not all, you know, kind of uh, flat or, or two-dimensional. Um, but but there's multi-level structures, towers, there's uh, underground places, um, and, and yeah, many of them are, are multi-floor. Um, um, we we love to play smaller dungeons, you know, not like dungeon crawl type of setups, um, where there's you know maybe six, eight, twelve rooms. So you know, not like twenty, fifty. Um, it's 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 more approachable, you know, faster kind of flow to the to the exploration of it, mm -hmm. and and we can concentrate on every single room. And our illustrators are actually illustrating the maps, keeping in mind that you know there's a corpse in the corner, uh, there's a desk in the corner, so so everything is is specified uh, from the adventure descriptions onto the maps, and uh, and the same goes for you know full body monster illustrations and and uh, and NPCs as well. So we want to present you know exactly the visuals. Um, that are in the book itself. It's it's you know always a challenge, of course, because mm -hmm. it you know the narrative part of it changes a lot. Um, but but uh, we're we're giving very detailed specifications to our designers or to our illustrators, and the maps are coming out amazing. So uh, mm -hmm. you know we're, we're floored every time we get a new one, and we're working actually on the capital right now by district by district. 
Um, we should be done in a couple of weeks and then we can release a kind of time lapse, you know, video of how the, the capital city came about. And, uh, you know, keep in mind that, you know, we have 80 unique <laughs> locations that on the city map, you know, look unique, of course. Yeah. And when it comes to the GM and player versions of the map, is the difference mainly um, monster placement? No, no, no. It doesn't. Neither map contains monsters, so it's it's mm -hmm. more uh, numbers. You know, room numberings, um, and secret doors are not drawn in. Traps are not, uh, you know, uh, visualized on the player version, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and on the DM version, you, you see everything. All right, but that... it's it's, us it's it's usable for both. So so monsters are monster tokens are not included. Yeah. Now, obviously, get, now I I know some pe I know some people have have attributed this to the pandemic, but obviously, um, a lot of people are shifting towards virtual tabletop, which I I've always I had always argued that was something was going that something like that was going to happen inevitably, but. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the, when it comes to that, have you guys looked into um, get into getting it support for virtual tabletop, whether it be Fantasy Grounds or um, Foundry? Yeah, we, I mean, uh, the plan right now is is not to do it, or at least we probably won't have resources to to get that done. Mm -hmm. um, Year of Rogue Dragons was released or is available on Fantasy Grounds. And it's a major task to, you know, to to basically segment the entire book into, you know, sentence bits and each encounter and each monster and each item and each room, mm -hmm. you know, ha has has a separate entry and it's a nightmare to use uh, that software. So uh, depends on, I would say, our our future sales. So once we actually publish Crown of the Oathbreaker and it hits hits the shelves, um, you know, and and we'll see what kind of uh, proceeds we'll have in the future. Mm -hmm. And you know, probably we won't do it because I'm and and uh, Gabor and Dave are are definitely not prepared with our own time to <laughs> to go through that uh, editing, uh, you know, ordeal. Um, so maybe we can outsource that to to some experts, you know, who there's there's a couple. People, of course, that that do this, you know, that's their main kind of, uh, uh, you know, core business or expertise. And uh, you know, if all goes well, then then we are not ruling it out, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, but maps, you know, all of them are going to be available in in super high definition versions. So you know, people are definitely welcome to to take them and import them into, you know, their their uh, their virtual tabletop software and to use them um, mm -hmm. as well as monsters of course um, but uh, but uh, but that's the plan as yeah. of yet so, so now we're leaving it we're leaving it open for now now what are you shooting for as far as a release window well we have November this November uh, in mind uh, Illustrations. It's it's mainly about the you know pace of of the illustrations because mm -hmm. it's it's a team team of designers working on this, but uh, we have over a thousand images to do. Um, or actually, sorry, a thousand hours of uh, of illustrations to to undertake. We've we're done with about a, a quarter of them mm -hmm. um, over a couple months. So uh, since October. Um, when we started, um, so it's it's we're making good headway, but there's there's you know as I said 750 hours of work to do on on the illustration side um, should be done by late summer um, at, at this pace, and uh, we've uh, started of course writing the adventure the main you know plot and all the ideas are are set in stone and and. Uh, already down on paper um mm -hmm. so at this point it's it's really sitting down the three of us and and uh you know dedicating as much time to this as possible keeping in mind that all of us have day jobs um mm -hmm. and and we're 
busy people <laughs> but uh but you know we love uh we love this this project it's it's our you know love child and uh and 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 we hope really hope that by november you know we can we can have it finished and by the end of the year it's it's ready and uh and and edited and uh you know beautifully illustrated and uh and looking great mm -hmm. well with I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how it tur how it turns out. Um, with that with that thank said, you. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the um, bit of, enjoy the bit of insanity that comes up here in the temple. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, my pleasure. I mean, I you know as I said, I I love uh, uh, you know talking about D and D and and. Of course, Crown of the Oathbreaker, mm -hmm. which which is a, a you know a super project that that we're really proud of, and and we wanted to you know introduce it to and and get it in front of as many people as possible, mm -hmm. and and hope that everybody finds the same amount of enjoyment and enthusiasm that that we have for the project. Yeah, so that, and that's our goal. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good to hear that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>